Welcome to Red Rocks Church. Uh, as Doug said, we're starting this series, Church by Design. And the idea is that we wanna put language for you uh, to what we're gonna be, who we're gonna be as a church, what we're gonna do, what the design is, what our DNA is. And uh, we put together this statement, kind of overarching for this series and for our church, and it's this. We want to be a church where the doors are wide, the roots are deep, and the reach is far. And that sounds really idealistic, it sounds like this big, audacious idea. Yeah, every church wants to be that. And most people would tell you a church leans one way, like you're maybe really wide and there's a lot of room for people, but you don't have much depth beneath the surface. Or you're really focused on depth, but there's not much room for people who are new to faith or don't know what they think. Or maybe you're a church that's all about the local or global mission. And so you would be told by somebody who's a little more cynical maybe, this is kind of, your church is gonna become one dimensional eventually. And we just don't agree with that. We actually say, why not be a church where the doors are wide and the roots are deep and the reach is far? So putting it in terms of the acid trip house prom promo video you just saw, um, here's the idea. If that's a little shell of a house, if that represents us, there's a lot of work to be done on that house, right? This house. And that house needs a front porch. So we're building a front porch in Austin. We're welcoming home prodigals. We're making heaven more crowded. We have doors that are wide, so you're welcome on our front porch. And that house needs a back porch. We're building a back porch where, hey, you've been on the front porch for a while, but guess what, you're family. So come inside and let's go sit on the back porch and let's grow. Let's put roots down. Let's put depth in our faith and in our relationships. And then you scale up to this drone view of the house and you see that there's these roads that kind of go out into all directions of the world from this house. So as we welcome people into our family and as we grow deep together, then we go back out into the world and our reach is much farther than what happens in these four walls. And that's what we're gonna talk about today is the third dimension of being a church that reaches far. And I think that it sort of happened by default that we were gonna preach in this order just with our calendars. One of us talk about a dimension each week but I now think it's by design that we start this series with like the drone view of the future and of our church, that we have this big picture perspective to put it in, I don't know why Doug just gave a plug for the Avengers, but to put it in terms of the Avengers, when you walk out of a movie, like an epic movie that ends well and good wins and something awesome happens, you walk out and it's like, you're not even thinking about the little things in your life. You're just fired up about this epic story and you wanna be a part of something like that. And I want us as a church to have that feeling today as we talk about being a place that reaches far, that we have that like relaxed and excited, joyful feeling. I wanna go be a part of something. And so let's pray that God would just bring that into this room and then we'll dive into it. Jesus, I thank you for every person here who's um, a part of this family. And I pray that this, uh, this message that today you would speak to us about what it looks like to be a church that reaches far, that you would give us inspiration and ideas that our church, that these roads that you have for us when we leave these four walls all over the world, that we would have an impact so much bigger for our city and for our country and for this world, that we would be a place that reaches far. In Jesus' name, amen. So a couple years ago, uh, Doug and I were talking in my living room about the quickly approaching 4th of July. And I, if there are boyfriends, husbands in the room, okay? Wow, well... You maybe talk to somebody after service. I, whew, okay. Well, to the three of us, um, there's like this, you know, here's some training for you guys. So there's this holiday pressure that comes up in relationships. Like, you know, Columbus Day is vastly approaching, so I better get to work on building this boat for my wife so that she can Instagram that I'm this amazing, spontaneous husband. You know, my wife doesn't put that pressure on me but it's the digital scrapbook of Instagram. Every holiday, you're like, I, I gotta come up with something great to prove myself to the world that I'm a worthy husband or boyfriend. It's St. Patrick's Day, so I better have like painted our whole house green to surprise her when she woke up, right? So Doug and I, we had married our wives the summer before, so it's like first, fourth of July, we gotta do something big. So I, because it's us, by the end of the conversation, we told our wives, pack a bag, spontaneous road trip, we're going to Vegas for the fourth of July. This is the Rowdy Six. It's okay to nod about Vegas if you've been there. You're still allowed in church. Okay, so Ryan was a few hours away in California. He said he'd meet us there, and we're just gonna have a little getaway. I'm talking to a friend of mine before we leave, and he asked, what are you doing for the 4th of July? 
Like, well, you know me, spontaneous, Instagrammable husband that I am. Uh, we're taking a spontaneous trip to Vegas, no big deal, just kind of, you know, that type of thing that I just do. And uh, he's like been married for a while, so he rolls his eyes at me like, that'll wear off, whatever, man. But he gets real excited because he takes a Vegas trip every year with a friend. And so he asks me, uh, are you going to play games while you're there? Meaning, are you going to gamble while you're there? And I said, of course not. I'm a minister. <laughs> this was years ago. So I actually said, yeah, I'm going to play blackjack, maybe just a little bit. And uh, he says, well, I have a system I bet with when I play blackjack. Do you want to learn it? It's not counting cards. It's nothing illegal or immoral when you're in a casino gambling in Las Vegas. It just takes the emotion out of betting. So here's what people do on a table when they play blackjack. Oh, I feel really good about this one. They put a big stack and then they lose, right? Or, oh, I lost two or three, so the table is cold. And so they just do the minimum and then they win and they wish they had bet more. We just bet off emotion. And so the system goes like this. He says, you're going to be playing at a $5 table, judging me, saying that I wouldn't be at the high roller table. I'm going to be at a $5 table, which was true. But um, you're going to make, you need $105 to play. And I said, all right, well, I just had my birthday, so I'm going to swing it. So you make nine stacks of chips, $5, $5, $5 in the first row, 10, 10, 10, and then 20, 20, 20. And what you do is you you play the five. If you lose it, you play the next five. You lose it the next five and then 10 all the way down to the last 20. And so the point is you just keep betting whatever your system tells you, no matter what you're feeling about the table, because here's the deal with gambling. If you think it's stupid and irresponsible, you're right. Like those casinos are built off of our losses. That's why they exist because we go and do that. So it's, it's a dumb use of your money. They tell you the odds are not for you. So maybe this helps a little bit. He says, we've had some success. And if you're right now rattled because I'm talking about gambling and I'm a pastor and I've gambled before, as I said in the four o'clock, nobody took me up on it, but I can tell you after service about things I've done that are a lot worse than gambling and you can pray for me because I need it. So I got my $105, my wife to impress. We get in the car and we go down to Vegas with our friends and I wake up on the 4th of July and I thought, this is a big day for America. This is a big day for Ethan because I'm going to make my first million at the $5 table in the New York, New York. So I sit down and start playing the system and they can all vouch for me. I sat at that table and played blackjack for over eight hours straight. Yeah, yeah don't clap for that. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, Steph would like come by and, and she'd be like, hey, so this is cool that you planned this surprise trip for me so you could come to Las Vegas and just sit on a blackjack table and talk to no human beings while we're here. Fun memory. Let me put you on Instagram. Here's my awesome husband. He's been at this table for eight hours. Lucky me. So anyway, I played, I think I ended up winning like 50 or 75 bucks. And if you do the math, that's below minimum wage, but it was fun. And uh, I realized as I started playing that day, when my friend taught me the system, I never thought to ask him, hey, what happens if like, I've got all nine stacks and then I have extra money on the side that I've made? I didn't even think about that as a possibility, right? Because I had my $105 donation to give away. I just assumed it was gone. I assumed I'd just be in deficit the whole day. So I didn't even think to ask what to do if I was winning. And that money that you put on the side, your winnings when you're playing cards, when you're gambling, that's called house money. That's the principle, house money. And that's your winnings. You came with your money and now you have this extra money. And house money is the principle that we're talking about tonight. This is not a gambling workshop. I'm just, it's a metaphor. Um, but the idea of house money, they've actually taken it into the investment world. And they say that the house money effect explains the tendency of investors and traders to take on greater risk when reinvesting profits that they've earned. So like at a table, you're more likely to bet big and risk with the house's money because you're not betting in fear of losing. Investors do the same thing. And so they've applied this in other places and I apply it to how we approach our spiritual lives. That I think most of us walk up to the table of life with the assumption like I did that day that I'm going to be in deficit. That I have this deficit with the dealer, if that's God, and my hope and prayer is by the end of this life that I can just get back to even with him. That's, that's how most of us, whatever your background is, a lot of Christian people, that's how they operate in their lives. We just kind of make moves and place bets in fear 
when it comes to life because we feel like we're in deficit to the dealer. And we never even think to ask, what if I'm playing with house money? Never even crosses our mind, just like it didn't for me. And the problem with that mentality of living life like you're in a deficit is it's the opposite of the gospel. It doesn't line up at all with the story of Jesus. So Jesus gives a preview of what this might look like when it plays out in Matthew chapter 10. It's like a mini mission trip thing. That's what the book of Acts turns into for a lifestyle. He tells his disciples, Matthew 10, seven through eight, as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So what he's saying is, Hey guys, everything you go do in your lives, every word you have, every prayer you pray, every resource you are given to, you give it away. Everything you have has freely been given to you by the Father, and so you now go freely give with your life. And and so that applies for us in our lives every single day. And I look at I look at Paul, and uh, he writes in Ephesians 1:13. This is a guy who played with house money. If you've read his story, in him you also. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. He's saying, hey, when you heard the gospel, when you heard the good news of Jesus and you took hold of that, your deficit's been dealt with. And your inheritance, your seal, the presence of God in your life, your salvation, having the presence of God in your life is the sealing. It shows you this seal around you that your inheritance is the kingdom of heaven forever. That's what you've been given, okay? So Paul, basically what he's saying, what Jesus is showing and what his life, what the gospel says in this term is that if Jesus died for you, which he did, then you are no longer in deficit. Your deficit has been dealt with when you say your grace is sufficient for me, and I take that. You're my savior. Your deficit has been dealt with. And if he rose from the dead, which he did, then you are now playing the rest of your life with house money. Everything you've been given, you have an endless supply from Jesus. And the currency of this principle of living life playing with house money, the currency is grace, right? Because that's what, that's what took care of the deficit. And now that's what we have to go take to the world. And so I was talking to a guy named Chad Brugman. Some of you guys know him. And we were talking about this principle because he's a guy who has preached about it and he lives it. He's a guy who gets the fact that we're playing with house money. And we're talking on the phone and he rattles off this amazing quote, like it's second nature because it's just who he is. He says this, a strong understanding of the grace of God is where risk comes alive and fear goes to die. You're sitting at the table now and you don't place bets, so to speak, or live your life in fear anymore because you're not in deficit to the dealer. In fact, as Chad and I were talking, he's saying to take this analogy a little further, the dealer has actually given you so many chips that you need another table for the stacks on stacks on stacks on stacks of grace that you've been given. Fear has gone to die and risk comes alive. And I, I noticed when I was playing uh, that fateful day, eight hours of blackjack, I noticed the guy at the table who had a lot of house money. He was doing really, really well. And when somebody else at the table was running low, like you should split those cards, but they didn't have enough money to make a second bet or double down or whatever. This guy just kept being like, here you go. Hey, you need some, here you go. I'm looking at that guy, I'm thinking about this in the bigger context of life. Like, I wanna be like that guy who just sees people at the table of life around him and is like, here you go. You need more grace, here you go. I look, at, look at all this house money I've got. Well, here you go. So the foundation of this principle is grace. Grace has dealt with the deficit. Jesus has dealt with the deficit. And if we have an understanding of that reality, then from that foundation, the fruit is how far grace moves us to reach in our lives. Okay, so let's go back to Paul as an example. Crazy life, shipwrecks, getting beaten, kicked out of cities, bitten by snakes, things that are insane to read about. And he's sitting in a jail cell in Rome at the end of his life, the capital of the world. He, the guy who went out to stop the church ended up helping start it. 
and now he's in a jail cell in Rome gonna be executed for what he's done for the kingdom of God. He writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy, Timothy 4, 6, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. He gets to the end of his life, and he looks back on everything he's done, and he says, every day of my life, once Jesus knocked me off of my horse on the road to Damascus, man, every day of my life, I've just been playing with house money. I've just been, hey, God gave me this, let's pour it out to the world. I'm being poured out my whole life. I've just been poured out. Everything he's given me, I have freely given. And he's lived this crazy life and now he's in jail writing this. And you're like, Paul, why did you keep going? Why did you just keep playing with house money over and over? He writes 2 Timothy 4, 18. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. He says, what is death gonna do to me? What is sin gonna do to me? What is shame? There's no place in my life for those things because I realized that my deficit was dealt with and so now I'm just playing with house money. Those things have no hold on me anymore. And guess what? Worst case scenario, when I go to be killed here in Rome, the Lord will bring me safely into his kingdom. My inheritance is the kingdom of God forever. So this is a guy who's fearless, who took enormous risks and it inspires us and we hear those things and I believe that that's our heritage, that that's who we're called to be as believers. People who don't focus on the deficit anymore because it's done. We focus on what God gives us freely into our hands and what we can do with it. And so if you're here, we're claiming you as Red Rocks family, you're a part of this place and it's important that you know that we stand on a foundation of generosity. That's one of the, at the top of the list of our uh, the, the pillars of things that we care about at this church is generosity. If you think about it, if you don't know, Red Rocks Austin started 15 years ago, something like that. And we are a church plant launched out of a church in Denver that was started by some friends who wanted to build a front porch for prodigals and make heaven more crowded. And as they've grown, these guys are risk takers and they play with house money. And so they said, well, hey, why don't we go plant a Red Rocks church somewhere else? That's where this idea came from. This is a giant risk to take, to plant a church in another place that's, that's our DNA, that's who we are. And we don't do things like this because we're trying to grow the Red Rocks brand or we're trying to grow the Red Rocks kingdom. We do this because we are trying to grow the kingdom. So right now, Corey's over in India, our worship leader, Corey, he's in India. And he's, he's with this ministry that we partner with. And here's what they do. They train up pastors and they send them to remote villages where these people have never heard the gospel before. There's no church in this village. There's no Bible. There's, there's millions of these villages. I know that's hard to fathom on our side of the world where there's a church almost on every corner. He's on the other side of the world right now and these pastors are graduating and these guys live in a society where they feel like always under the pressure of a deficit to the gods that they will never make up. And then somebody grabbed hold of them and said, no, 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 let me tell you about who Jesus Christ is. And all of a sudden they realized, well, I don't need to worry about that anymore. Well, look at all these people in my country who don't know this, so I'm gonna go tell them. So they need transportation and some of our Red Rocks guys came up with an idea to build Red Rocks bikes to give to these pastors so that they can ride out with a Bible and a bongo on a bike to these villages and they can plant churches and they can tell people about Jesus Christ. Corey's getting to witness that right now. I heard a story a few years ago at Red Rocks. There was a pastor, uh, a local pastor in Denver who uh, before the holidays, all of his equipment was stolen. It was set up teardown model like us. So imagine the container of our equipment, we show up on a Sunday, it's gone. And because we're part of a church that lives with this principle of playing with house money, our leaders wrote a check and sent it to him and said, hey, go buy new stuff. And I'm telling you these things not because I'm bragging. I didn't write those checks. I didn't come up with those ideas. I'm telling you because this is who you are if you're part of this family. This is our DNA. There's compassion centers in places like Haiti and Rwanda. We have partnerships in other places in the world and we're about the kingdom of God and the church and building it. That's what you're a part of, okay? And if you can't tell, this, gets, this is like what I'm passionate about. This is what I lay awake at night thinking about in a great way of like, Man, this church, these people, what could we do? How far could the gospel take us as a church in this world? So we say to these things that we already have partnered with at Red Rocks, yes, let's do more and let's build more partnerships and let's grow the kingdom in other places in the world. Let's keep 
going. That's what Red Rocks Austin is. If we're a risk, then out of our risk that we were born from, we're gonna go take more risks for the kingdom of God. And I've, I've had the privilege, my faith was born out of seeing the church in other contexts. I, it was kind of birthed out of being in other countries and seeing like God moving in all these places in different languages. And I just, it's just, I think God had to show me something really extreme because he realized how like slow or dumb or whatever I am. And so I spent four years as a missions pastor before I came down here at a church called Jubilee Fellowship Church in Denver. And I had a front row seat to what this principle, playing with house money, could mean in the world. This church, Jubilee, they're cut from the same cloth as we are at Red Rocks. Generosity, generosity is at the top of the list. And so I got to take checks and people all over the world into these different contexts and say, hey, we believe in you and we believe in the church here and we believe in the kingdom of God and we wanna help grow it. I got to just be the like, messenger for that principle for four years from this church who has the same heart of generosity. And the pastor at this church, his name's John Leach, he's a mentor and a friend in my life. When my time, when I felt like my time was coming to a close at that church because I had some college buddies that I wanted to go follow after some dreams with, his response was, great, how can I help? And so he's been along this whole journey with us because he's a guy who plays with house money. Well, he always told me, when your church gets rolling, I want you to come preach for a weekend and tell us, tell our church about Red Rocks Austin, about what God's doing. So two weeks ago, I got to go do that. And think about that principle. This is a pastor who's bringing in another pastor who's from a church in another state that was birthed out of another local church in Denver. And he's saying, come preach at our church and tell us the story because we wanna encourage and support your church. Okay, so it gets better. I go to that church and I get to preach this weekend. It was a blast to see all these amazing people. And I was talking to them about how this foundation in my life of generosity and open-handedness really became like concrete in my time there that I realize this is a principle I wanna live with. And I use the parable of the talents, and it's in Matthew chapter 25. If you've never read it, I encourage you to. I'm gonna paraphrase it really fast. So there's a master who goes on a journey. And while he's gone, he entrusts his servants with money. So here, this is a story that's a metaphor of the kingdom of God. So think about this. The master, who has tons of money, trusts his servants to work with what he has while he's gone. So he goes... And he gives the first servant five talents. Was It's a measurement of money. Five, another guy two, another guy one. Goes and comes back and checks in with them to see what they did with the amount that he gave them. And the first guy, he says, hey, you gave me five and I made five more. The master says, well done. You've been faithful with a little. I'm gonna put you over a lot. You're a partner now here with me. And the second guy, you gave me two. I made two more. And he says the same thing. And then the last guy who got one talent he says, hey, um, I was afraid. I think that you're probably harsh. You're probably gonna be mad at me. And so I just buried it. I didn't do anything with the talent that you gave me. I didn't do anything. The master is angry. And he's like, you, you took no risk. You're play it safe. Like, what a terrible way to live with what I've given you. He says, get this guy out of here, basically. And it's this harsh story that we don't quite know what to do with. But as I dug into that story, what I realized is that each of these servants acted out of how they perceived the posture of the father to be towards them or the master to be towards them, like Doug talked about last week. Like if you think that God doesn't like you, if he's harsh, if he's angry, if you're in deficit to him, then you're just gonna go like that, right? Just like this guy. So maybe we focus on that guy because we relate to that but I think that we should focus on the other two guys because they had this understanding of the master. They had been given more, so maybe they knew the master better. And they said, hey, we're playing with house money, so let's go take risks. And they made more of what he gave them, okay? So I tell that story at this church, talk about generosity. I thank them for teaching me this principle and all they've done in my life. I get off the stage, the pastor gets on stage and he closes out the service and he says at the first service, while I was sitting over there during this, I felt the Lord speak to me that we're going to give our entire offering this week to Red Rocks Austin. Do you realize like how crazy that is to do that as a church? Okay, so he, he calls me a few days later and he says, here's the deal. Um, this is a miracle. This is from God. Our church is just happy to be a part of it and be a conduit for generosity. We believe in what's happening in Austin. We believe what's happening in your church. He said, this, the weekend you preached was the lowest attendance we had in six months because of the weather. And maybe it was because I was there, but he said it was because of the weather. 
the lowest attendance that they had had in six months and the highest offering in that same weekend, in that same time. He said, we believe in your church and we're sending you $80,000. $80,000. So yeah, you can clap and say thank you to them. Okay? That is a picture of a guy who's looking over at his side table and just like, give it away. Pour it out. Everything for the kingdom. He said that to me. I'm like, dude, you can't give us that. He goes, what a win for the kingdom. That's what he said. Of those 80 thousands, one of those thousands came from a 17 year old kid who sat down with his parents after and he said, I feel like God's telling me to give away $1,000 to that church in Austin. The kid had $1,600 to his name. So he just gave away 62.5% of his net worth at 17. Because somehow that kid, I guess because he's part of that church, understands the concept of house money and says, whatever God says to me to grow the kingdom, pour it out, give it away. A 17-year-old kid. So I, I was uh, joking about this in the last service that everybody right now is saying, let's go. You know, it's like this common phrase. It's, you know, like, Qdoba bar, let's go. <laughs> what? <laughs> hey, do you want to come over and hang out later? Let's go. <laughs> okay. Just simple yes would have been fine. It started with like touchdowns and chest bumps, like let's go and sit back down and watch the guys that actually should be chest bumping and saying let's go, keep playing the game and little kids. In my research, I Googled, why is everyone saying let's go so often? And it was just like, because it's a common phrase. It's like Google was asking me back like, you're not serious. You're kidding me. But I, it, there was one thing that was about video games, so I guess kids say that a lot, like they're all teaming up their headsets on an alien, like choo, 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 let's go. I don't know. So anyway, it's a common phrase right now, and, and this was a let's go moment for me. Like I get this call from this pastor, and he says, we believe in what God's doing in your church. We want to help you be a church with doors that are wide and roots that are deep and a reach that is far, so here you go. We've, I, I've felt like, yeah, we're building this house, and eventually maybe we'll We'll go be, you know, have an impact in this world. We'll reach far. And God's like, no, 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 now. Here you go. And I don't have a breakdown of how we're gonna, what we're gonna do with $80,000. Surprisingly, never dealt with that before. But I can tell you that we will be generous and we will make investments into the kingdom of God all over the world. And we will put down deep roots in this city so that we're here to stay. And we will open our doors wider and wider and wider. That's what we will do. So that, that's a let's go moment for me. I had one six years ago. I was listening to a sermon and this is a story about money and I'm not gonna at the end of this like, be like, so would you like to give? Like it's normal offering, but we're not taking some special offering. This isn't about money, okay? But it's a principle that speaks to the resource of what God has for us. So the pastor said, if American Christians, if people who profess to be Christians in America tithed 10% and then the church went to work with it, Okay, so the church goes to work with that money in the world. It would generate $46 billion, okay? That was six years ago, so maybe now we'd say 50 with inflation and more people, whatever. So much money that it's, let's say 50 billion, okay? If the church went to work with that, here's what I think would happen. Generations down the line, they would look back on our time right now and they'd say things like this. Hey, did you know there was a time on earth when people were dying from waterborne illnesses because they simply didn't have access to clean drinking water, like diarrhea killed people. Did you know that? And people were like, no, it's not like that anymore. What happened? Well, the Christians took care of that. Hey, did you know that there was a time when kids all over the world had no access to education? They had no hope for a job because they couldn't even go to school. Well, it doesn't seem like that's the case anymore. Well, what happened? Well, the church stood up and took care of that. Did you know that there was orphans, millions and millions of orphans in the world? Parents had died or had left them. And somebody would say, well, it doesn't seem like, it seems like that number's dropped and dropped and dropped. Well, what happened? Well, the Christians took care of that. They opened their doors and they brought kids into their homes. Did you know there was a time in the early 2000s when there were more slaves on earth than ever before in history that people were sold and trafficked like property? Well, what happened? Well, the Christians stood up and they said, not in our world, not on our watch. They used their platforms and raised awareness and their resources and said, this isn't happening anymore. And they dealt with it. Did you know that there's villages all over the world where there's people who, who didn't know the gospel back then? Like 
They'd never heard of Jesus. There was no church. There was no Bible in their language. Well, what happened with the Christians, man? They said, not on our watch. And they trained up pastors and they put them on bikes and they sent them to village after village after village after village. And then those people in that village heard the reality that they don't have a deficit, but they're playing with house money. So then they went to their families in another village and it just multiplied throughout the world. Did you know that there there was this time where it seemed like everyone was lonely and struggling and anxious and depressed? Suicide was rampant. Well, what happened? Well, the Christians, they, they stood up and they started loving people well and they started providing resources and professional help and they started teaching people how to dive into their issues and grow from them and find healing from a dealer who says, you're not in deficit to me. I've actually got chips of grace for you. Here you go. The church did that. Did you know that there was a time when people didn't feel welcome in the house of God? that people were, Christian people were prejudiced towards other people? Really? Well, that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Why? Because Christians realize how stupid prejudice looks in the face of the gospel. And they said, okay, anybody and everybody is welcome in our church, and we're gonna introduce you to Jesus Christ, and he's gonna go to work in your life, and you're gonna be transformed, and guess what? Then you're gonna go play with house money and invite somebody else. That's the stuff that I want to happen. I I believe that this church will be at the center of, of efforts like that, that we will be those people. And I know I'm talking about giant issues in the world, but God goes like this with the world, right? And we're his people. And so $50 billion to God is like, cool. Like the resources that God has tangibly, but, but even more so the words he has, the friendships, the relationships, the freedom that he has for us to give away, it's infinite. Endless stacks on stacks. So our time, our money, our words, our prayers, our gifts, our influence, technology, leveraging what's at our fingertips, films we make, songs we write, sermons we give, all of those things, the connections we have. This world is more connected than ever. We leverage everything we have for the kingdom of God. Freely we have been given, so freely we go give, okay? That's the principle. And so this might sound like, wow, okay, big picture. And you might be thinking, but probably not me. God's not gonna use me in in the face of something like that. You might think that. So I'll close with this and band, you guys can come back up and I'll share a little bit of myself with you. So I stood as a college student, the genesis of my relationship with God, I stood as a college student at a bonfire in Cuba of all places. I ended up jumping on a mission trip. I didn't really know what I thought of God. I was pretty positive that he did not like me that he wouldn't want anything to do with me. You Google college guy, and that was me. Everything that's, that you want in this life, everything that you could go for, everything you're not supposed to do as a Christian, I did all of that. So I figured, okay, well, God doesn't want much to do with me. Maybe I'll go do this trip, and then maybe my deficit will be a little bit less. But I was on that trip, and I started to see freedom in the lives of the people around me, on my team, and these Cuban pastors who, in the face of oppression, are just like, Whatever, we're playing with house money. We know our inheritance, who cares? We're gonna take big risks. And I'm watching all these people and I'm like, they have something that I don't have. I'm standing under the stars and I'm like, okay, Jesus, if, it, if this, is what, this is what I'm reading and this is what I'm hearing, that I have felt my whole life like there is this giant deficit and that you would not wanna do anything with my life. But if the reality is that you died for me and, and you took care of that deficit, then uh, I'll sign up. And if the reality is that then you will use my broken story to go help other people in the world, if you're gonna hand me chips and stacks of grace to give away, then let's go. That was like my first let's go moment right then. And I went from there and made every mistake you can make and, and tried to figure out what it looks like to have a relationship with Jesus and be a Christian, all that stuff. But I kept coming back to these let's go moments where God would be like, not about you, It's not about your deficit, I took care of that. All I need is for you to be willing. Just keep saying, let's go. So I found myself a couple years later, standing under the stars in India, on the other side of the world. And that that country keeps coming up because it's a place that God is moving and we're gonna have an impact there. And I'm standing under the stars and I'm filming video for a ministry there who my friend started Uh, to show the stuff that he's doing. And in that moment, I'm like, look at this. Like, I know how to use a camera and God's using me to tell a story, something cool happening in India. So the the guy who founded the ministry, he comes over and he's like, hey, I need you to come with me. We were at a medical clinic that his ministry was putting on. So Indian doctors, these amazing Christian people are giving free healthcare to people who don't have access to it. So I'm documenting that. He says, come with me. We walk down this dirt road 
and he says, I need to go talk to the people over at that house. But at this house right here, there's a family sitting in the back behind their house with one of our translators. And they've been hearing that these pastors have started coming to their village and that people have been talking about someone named Jesus and they've seen this medical clinic and it seems like something's happening in their village. So they're curious. They would like to know who Jesus is. So go tell them and he walks away. These people have no context for this. So I walk, I sit down in their backyard and I just start telling them about, hey, I know what it's like to live feeling like you have a deficit. I know what it's like to, to feel the weight crushing you through your whole life that I'll never get back to even. I'll never, it's an impossible task. Well, here's the good news. And good news has never sounded like such good news when you're staring into the faces of people who've never heard it before and have lived their whole life feeling like they're in chains. Let me tell you about Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about your creator. Let me tell you about a, a God who sent his son to take care of your deficit. And guess what? Here's some house money to go play with. That's the invitation for you. I didn't use that analogy because I assumed they had never been to Las Vegas before. But I told them that, that story. And they start talking as a family. And they're talking to the translator in their language, so I don't understand. And I'm just sitting under these stars like, God, of all people, I'm here right now. That's how I feel standing on this stage. Of all people, me, I'm here right now. I've done everything I'm not supposed to. If I had to measure my deficit, it's enormous. I'd never dig myself out of it. And, and God, it felt like God was just like, yeah, you know what though? You just keep saying, let's go. And look at how far the gospel has taken you. And we make fun of each other and we make fun of ourselves. And, and it's truly out of like a genuine place of how we are. But I think that when God started moving in our lives, we felt like, man, if one day we got to be a part of great things for the kingdom, then people would say, hey, if God would use those guys, then he sure as heck could use me. I've got no excuse. If, if Ethan and Doug and Ryan are pastors at a church, then what's my excuse to not grow the kingdom? Seriously. Standing under those stars and I'm like, well, all right, God, then let's go. And those people, they threw the translator say, our family talked and we wanna know this Jesus. So I got to pray with them. I got to tell them more about Jesus, introduce them to these pastors. The last person that should ever be on the other side of the world in a village that I couldn't find on a map, looking into the faces of people who just encountered the concept of house money. And so I believe that in this church, our reach will be far. That grace will bear much fruit in this house. And when we go out onto the open roads from here, that we will look back as a church years and years and generations down the line and they'll say, man, I guess they just decided it was, there was no point in worrying about the deficit anymore. And they just started taking risks and playing big for the kingdom of God. They had house money, they had stacks on stacks on stacks of grace. And look at how far the gospel took them. That's your invitation as we design this church and that's who I believe we're gonna be. Would you stand and pray with me? Jesus, I thank you right now. I pray that this would be a let's go moment for our church. I pray that people in this room would be inspired with ideas and possibilities and dreams that, that seem so risky and so crazy, but it's the kingdom of God. And so the fact is that you've secured our inheritance. You've sealed us with your presence. And we thank you for that, Jesus. And we ask, God, let us reach far into this world with everything we have. I pray that faces and neighborhoods, this city, our country, this world, nations far away, that they would be impacted, that history would be different because Red Rocks Austin played with house money and that the global church played with house money. Freely you have given us, God, so show us all the possibilities and ways to freely give it all away. In Jesus' name, amen.